Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Each episode is a conversation with inspiring people who make wonderful contributions to our knowledge in these areas and spark curiosity and ideas to pursue. Join me, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. Your unique experiences in life, your view of the world is that lens. Don't get so caught up on the content. What do you view and see about this that's different? Because if you're selling sunshine, you can't stand out by selling better sunshine. The only way you're going to stand out is by helping people see hyper focus the way you see it. And I think that's another great way to stand out is having that clarity of understanding of how you see the world and what you bring to the table is way more valuable than the information that you can search online or read in other books is because you're unique. You're the only you in the world who can see it this way. So that's the thing I help people see is like, those are the qualities we're looking for in books. That's what makes us really want a book. We want to see ourselves in a book and a new idea or an old idea rehashed in a way we didn't think about before. Hi there, Innovator. It's great to be back with another episode. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. I trust too that you enjoyed my recent conversations with Brad Smith of Simplecast and with Scott Perry of Creative On Purpose. I'm really excited to have today on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, Azul Taronas. Azul is the host of the Born to Write podcast and he's also a co-founder of the Authors Writing Academy. Now, Azul dreamt for a long time about writing a book and even helped many of his students write and publish books while he was still a teacher. Only when he set himself a challenging deadline to write his own book did he get started, and then he completed that book in 30 days. After that, one person at a time, Azul started helping people find their vision for their book, distill it, and take actionable steps to make it happen. Today, he helps authors write and publish their books. A quick promotional message from our sponsor, that's Innova Biz, where we help coaches and consultants build professional credibility, engage their target audience, and connect with their ideal clients. Now, that requires absolute clarity about who your ideal clients are and how you can help them. To help you get clarity about who your ideal client is, take a look at our Marketing Master Mini Class. In less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity on your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. Access the Marketing Master Mini Class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It is completely free and it's accessible without giving away your email. In our discussion today, Azul talked to me about how to overcome writer's block by emptying your head of the myriad of ideas you almost certainly have. He explained how writing a book is more about who you are than what you know. And we talked about how to start conversations worth having. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Azul Taronas. Hi, I'm your host Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to welcome today to the InnovaBuzz podcast from San Juan, Puerto Rico in the USA. It is part of the USA, right? Correct. Azul Taronas, who's the CEO and co-founder at Authors Who Lead and the Authors Writing Academy. So welcome to the podcast, Azul. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Great. Thank you so much. It's my honor. Christina Nicholson, who was our guest on episode 211 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you, Azul. So big hello to Christina as well. Yeah, of course. She's a wonderful host. She's been on my podcast as well. Yeah. Now, you're essentially a book writing coach. You help people find their vision for their book, distill it, and take actionable steps to actually get it 
um, written and published. Now, you also host the Born to Write podcast and you're the author of several books yourself, which mm-hmm. qualifies you in, in a large degree to help people write their own books. Now, I'm really looking forward to digging more into how you help people with all those things. But before we do that, how did you get started writing books? How did you jump on and do your first book? Yeah. Well, you know, it was... Uh, I was an educator uh, for about 25 years. I taught uh, school-aged kids and college-age students, as well as um, was a principal in school. So I spent really a considerable time of my life in the classroom. Um, what what I discovered was when I returned from being a principal into the classroom, which I wasn't intending to do, but it worked out for me, is I realized if we could make kids care about writing, they'll get better at it. But the problem is no one really cared about the paper you assigned. So my goal was to say, what would motivate young people to care more? And I figured it was 2007, and I started to publish young children's works. Uh, I thought, well, if these 13-year-olds can become published authors, uh, that would be great motivation to finish their work. And it was true. So to see these young people walking around with their books, talking about their books was incredible. It changed and transformed them uh, as writers. And uh, the more I learned about that power, um, I started to think about all the years I had wanted to write a book, but never done it. Mm -hmm. Talked about it, thought about it, made lists of book ideas, uh, even started a few, but didn't finish. Um, So a student asked me, where's your book? (laughs) <laughs> and I thought for a minute I could like dance around this, but kids have a way of bringing the truth out of you. They don't let you get away with much. And I said, well, I don't have one. And they looked strange. They're like, well, why not? And all I could think of to say was because I'm scared and they shrugged their shoulders and walked away. Like, why would you be scared? You're the teacher. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's really, students are the ones that taught me about writing books. They taught me about fear and the things that adults struggle with when creating things. Young people don't have the same fear as adults because they're not trained to be afraid. Um, The closer they get, I think, to adulthood, the more they realize that there's something to be afraid of. Um, So that was one way in which I started. The other way was I signed up for an event with Pat Flynn, who runs the Smart Passive Income podcast, and another podcaster named Chris Ducker. Um, and they had this event for business owners. And like, come to this event, it's a one-day business breakthrough, and we'll help you with your business, we'll help you get clarity, we'll work on your website. I was like, oh, that sounds great. I bought the ticket, I didn't have the money, I was a school teacher on a limited budget, <laughs> but I went, or I signed up to go, and I realized the details of the event was, send us your website, how you monetize your work, who are your clients? And I didn't have even an idea. You're gonna, I didn't even know what I could possibly do because I was a teacher, but I wanted to, to live my world out uh, online and I saw these people traveling. I thought maybe that could do that someday, but I don't have an idea. Well, I went mm-hmm. to this event. Uh, well, I had the intention to go. I had about 30 days before it. Because I had no business or an idea, I decided that book I've been putting off for 24 years, that that kid said, where's your book? That I would write it. And so I say I wrote a book in... Uh, 24 years and one month because it took me exactly 30 days to actually finish that book because I had a really strong motivation, right? I had to show up with something. I couldn't just show up with empty hand and go, I signed up for this thing, but I don't have anything. <laughs> so that's really my, my book writing process where I became an author, where I stepped from behind the, the editorial role and into writing was uh, because of that event. And when I went there, people started asking me, well, how did you do it in 30 days? How did you how did you organize it? What was your writing plan? What did it look like? And that's really how I began coaching people was by really by accident. And that in school, it made sense when people asked me, could you help me? Of course, I can help you. I'm a teacher. I always believe I could help anybody who wants to learn. So it's sort of a naivete and not knowing anything about business. I didn't have any fear that I couldn't help them. I just never thought that this would be a business or a way that would sustain my life outside of school. And it's been quite a wonderful journey since then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a lot there to unpack. That's a wonderful story. Um, when when you wrote your book, your first one, and did that in 30 days, did, did you have a process in mind based on what you'd been working with the students or did you just kind of 
build it as you went? Well, a little bit of both. I mean, I had taken courses online. You know how many courses you buy online and you maybe take, <laughs> finish one if you're lucky. I had read a bazillion books about writing. I knew what I needed to do. It was the fear, right? So mm -hmm. it wasn't that I didn't know what to do or how to do it. I had a lot of fear about, well, what do I do when I launch it? Like, there were all things that happen after you actually write the book, which is what if people mm. don't review it? Like, what if it's no good and people, like, say bad things? That has nothing to do with writing. <laughs> but that's what was keeping me. So I think mm -hmm. what I learned is to put into place, you know, kids' rules, which is they play rules differently than adults. So adults have rules to keep you from doing something, and kids have rules to make you do more of them, like creating rules in the playground the intention of this is so you can keep playing, not to yeah. keep you from playing. Like they add a person to this team. There's a rule that goes with it because we can keep playing. Well, I just applied those kind of thinking that I've been teaching kids about writing and just applied it to myself, which is, you know, eat this elephant one bite at a time, plan out the book, figure how many words you need to write each day. And every day you write that no matter what, there's no option. You don't not write them. And then that's just how it gets. It is just a simple math. Like, I never really measured how many words I could write a day, but I would say I'm writing, but I was really staring at the screen, searching the internet, looking for good quotes, reading other books. That was my writing until then. And I think that was the biggest shift is that I had such a strong focus that I started to apply all the things that I had learned, but hadn't done. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. So um, the kind of sitting in front of the screen and doing some research and looking for models and reading other works and kind of telling yourself that's that's research, which it, research is important, I'm guessing, in, in writing a book. I mean, it certainly is in most creative endeavours. Uh, mm -hmm. But did you find that you were doing that to the extent that it was procrastination? Oh, yeah. I called writing, Just, researching writing when it wasn't. It, writing yeah, yeah. is words on a page. That's the only thing that counted in, is writing. So... Um, that was my biggest shift is I just, the fears were the reason I was researching, not because I didn't know what to say or do. I thought, well, I need to know for sure. Like, I don't want to say this and it's not right. And really it just became a never ending loop of looking for other people who are saying things and you'd find a contradiction and then another one would be the, so it, it was, it was my procrastination. As you said, I, I just think it was a way to avoid being wrong. And that was my biggest mm -hmm. fear. What if I'm wrong? What if I say these things and I'm not right? And once I realized that's a silly notion, I mean, hmm. who's right anyways? Yeah. So that, that helped. Did you have a blog at that time or were you publishing no. anything at all? No, I, I was publishing works with students and I was writing, yeah, sometimes yeah. I was writing academic books with them, but I wasn't publishing books about my ideas. Hmm. Uh, I was avoiding it. I, I even ghost wrote a book, but I, that doesn't have my name on it, you know, so there's a lot of easy ways out of it. Uh, <laughs> Ghostwriting a book's so much easier in some regards because it's not my ideas. I don't have to stand behind them. My job is just to put the words on a page as the author would want them. So, um, yeah, so there's there's definitely a difference of putting yourself out there. And I didn't have a blog. I, I barely would post on social media. I was one of those people that was really shy about being in front of people, <laughs> especially with my writing. I'm dyslexic, which made writing difficult for me growing up. And uh, I laugh now because I flunked freshman English in university. I had to take it again. Uh, and event eventually I finished my master's degree and became a, an English teacher of all things. And now a book coach <laughs> when I'm probably what, if you would ask my English teacher, if that would be my future path, I think they would have thought you're crazy. There's no way this kid <laughs> will be able to do that. Yeah. 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 Well, there's, there's some, uh, some irony in that, but there's also, it's also a testament to your, determination once you've found your passion that you know it doesn't matter what right what the past was or what what um perceived handicaps you might have you're going to overcome them so yeah absolutely yeah so give us a bit of a snapshot what do you do today and why yeah so i spend the majority of my time coaching authors usually they're authors who want to step in a role of leadership uh, to become a thought leader or to build their brand or to stretch into some new area that they want to become an expert in, but they're not currently seen that way. And so I spend my days helping people find the message, the conversation they want to own so that they can stay, stand on a stage and get paid for it or um, get that promotion or use their leverage for their business. Because having a, an authority in a book, which I discovered was is really useful, um, 
sometimes more useful than having those letters after your name that you get when you graduate with a degree. Um, and I've helped many people who, who you would think would be able to do it without help, but doctors, lawyers, you know, dentists, pharmacists, people who are well-educated, but the fear of putting your book and your idea out there and knowing what you should say, what's the right thing to say, what's the message I'm trying to say, those are all the places where people get lost. So my job is to help find that, that simple idea within them that's enough to build their brand and their books. Mm, mm, that's great. So you, you mentioned earlier, and I'm guessing this applies also to business owners or thought leaders as you um, call them, you mentioned earlier that kids, once they'd published the book, that it changed them completely, their, their whole mindset to learning and their um, their self-esteem was transformed because now they were an author. So it's right. it's kind of, this is what I am now. It's almost an identity thing. It's not right. just the pride in having achieved writing the book. It's the identity thing. So does that apply to business owners as well and, and how? Yeah. No, 100% it applies. Because you're standing for something sometimes new. Even if it's in the area of your expertise, you're saying, there's lots of people that talk about this, but this is what I'm standing for. This is what I'm willing to say I believe in. And that's the curation of your thoughts and beliefs around a particular topic. I believe books are transformational. They can be transactional. I mean, I use transactional books like a travel guide or a cookbook, or hmm. I used to have an old Volkswagen when I was in high school. You know how to fix that. <laughs> those are useful books, very transactional. I had, I had some of those too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fixing that 68 square back, needed, I needed a book to tell me how to. <laughs> yeah. But really, more recently, we don't need books on how to as much because we're drowning in information. What we need, though, is guidance, a vision. Who should we follow? Who should we trust? Who should we like? that talks about these topics because now we can choose. We're not just getting our information and our expertise from a few networks and a few radio stations and a few people, you know, who are saying I'm experts. Now anyone can put themselves out there and say, I'm declaring this as my expertise. But to stand out in a crowd, you have to really know what makes me different, what makes my message stand out. And the majority of those people see themselves just like we see themselves as if they're if they're doctor and lawyer that might seem impressive to us but doesn't seem impressive to other doctors and lawyers what's impressive is what are you going to stand for in th within that community who do you say you are and that brings up peer because they're afraid their peer groups is like we're afraid of ours and well what if it's not good what if i'm wrong and that part is where i help give them courage to say if you stand in your power and you're clear about your unique view in the world then you can't be wrong Information can be repeated. Someone could repeat what you know, like the, the content, but they won't be able to give them the vision or the lens of the things you think about and why you think of them in this way. And most people's biggest mistake in preparing to write a book or even speak from the stage is they struggle with finding what's my big idea. I need the big idea because they read these books and they see these authors and say, they have a big idea. I want to get mine. And so they get paralyzed and they don't know how to choose. And the biggest problem is, is that they misunderstood what big ideas are from. Big ideas really are small ideas that everyone passed up, looked over, and didn't notice. Hmm. And you notice, and you picked it up and go, hey, what about this idea? And people are like, oh, yeah, I didn't realize that. That makes so much sense. And a big idea is just a small idea that other people talk about. And I think that helps relieve some of the pressure for some people thinking, I have to have the big thing. And I say, well, those things are not your your realm of work. That's up to other people to make it big. Your job is to find the thing that makes you interesting, different, and unique and have something to talk about. So a lot of my work is helping people see through those things and kind of find their message within them that's so they can mm. stand up and have the same yeah, result as those kids to have like a proud and confident that this is what I'm supposed to say. Mm. That's, that's an amazing skill though, because I know, I mean, coming back to the point you made about uh, it doesn't have to be a big idea. It just has to be something that um, you know nobody else has put out there at this stage. And I think back to the books that have really hit a hit a note with me you know, that have 
impacted on me recently and they're all you know you get a chapter or so into the book and you think oh that's so obvious and it makes so so much sense you know and it's almost this is so simple why didn't I think of that you know and it's sort of easy to apply but it's like you say this was an idea that nobody else has picked up on or expressed in in this particular way yeah. And I guess it's uh, it's the same for presentations and speeches. I know I had a conversation with Terry Trespicio on on an episode a while back, and she was very much um, preaching the same message that you know the, you've got to have an idea that differentiates it. But you know your big idea it doesn't have to be um, the next kind of the next complete transformation or industrial revolution or um, right. you know IT res- revolution it's something that is personal to you it's something that nobody else has picked up on right most people um, that have a big idea go viral or it kind of explodes are just as surprised as everyone else <laughs> yeah because it's a small idea they just wondered and were curious about and go what about this who's you know we most of the time we think this is true but what if it wasn't what would be true and then people go, yeah, that's true. That's all you're looking for. And you know where I get this from? I read, like I told you, I studied diligently trying to figure out writing and what how it works. Some were great. Some just some were written by English majors that really like to use big words, and I would get lost. <laughs> and I think this is a lot of words to say something simple. But oftentimes I'd read books that had nothing to do about writing. And one of those books was uh, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. He's an FBI hostage negotiator. He works internationally to help free hostages who are taken for ransom. And I read his book and my curiosity is how does he get them to let people go without giving money? U.S. prides itself in not negotiating with um, terrorists so they won't give money. So how does he free these people? So that's what I was looking for. That was what I wanted to know. But the thing that I took away from that book that I applied to writing and to developing an idea is he said, once I got the hostage keeper to say, that's right. Building empathy on doesn't matter what it was. Mm-hmm. If he said something like, oh, you're the one who always has to do the dirty work, and that hostage nego- hostage said, or the hostage keeper said, yeah, that's right. He knew he had them. He knew he built empathy. He built a relationship that said, I understand you. That's essentially what you're trying to do when you're writing a book, is to get the right people to say, gosh, that's right. Why do we do that? That's all you need. Because now you're switching from what was to what could be. And that's the switch you need people to make if they're going to buy in your into your message, your conversation. Some of the best books in the world are never finished, like never finished reading. Think of all the books on your show that you bought intending to read, but just haven't got to yet. Hmm. We all have a list of those. And sometimes you even read a chapter or two and you go, gosh, that's interesting. And that's enough for you to go have a conversation and someone says, what are you reading? And you mentioned that book and you mentioned the idea you got from the book. And that's enough to start a really meaningful conversation and maybe even make a a switch in your life. But the message is more important than the words in the book. And I think people miss, miss this. They think that the words will make the book better. And that's true. Having well-written books and well-edited are super important, but only as important as the idea. Otherwise we would rush to get used textbooks from universities and read them, but we don't. It's not the quality of the the writing inside or the information. It's the belief of empathy you install into someone that maybe this can apply to them in a new way. And that's what most writers don't think about uh, until it's too late and they've missed their opportunity to impact people. And that's what I do is help them say, let's find that idea. The writing, we can. It, it's, a, it's a team sport. We have all these editors that can make it better, but we can't find that idea. That's up to you. That's the, that's the path you're on. That's your journey is to find that that small idea that could make someone go, that's right. Hmm. Yeah, that's, there's so much gold in what you've just said there and described because I think it's, you know, this is something that applies not just to book writing, it applies to any creative endeavor you do. In fact, you know, I think of marketing, the whole marketing process and the first step there is understanding your customer and then starting to build that relationship through through the process of empathy. So, you know, right. that that is just, gold yeah thank you it's the thing that that i think i wrestled with the most when writing any book is what's what's in it for me what's in it for the reader what what's the point of this could i have this in a five-minute conversation and if so would i keep having it if i could 
Because if I won't continue to have this five minute conversation with people, then why, why do I think someone's going to take a five hours of their life and have this conversation with me? It's got to be rich enough in passing as much as it would be in a five hour sitting on the couch. Let's talk. Cause that's all a book is, is, Hey, can I have five hours of your time? 10 hours, sit with me and let's talk. Yeah. But if you're not willing to talk to someone for five minutes about the topic and you're bored of it as the author already, and you're done with it. You're like, ah, oh, I'm done with it. Then it's not useful. It's transactional. Mm -hmm. Transformational books means I can't wait to tell you about what I've noticed. It's so different than what I expected, but here it is. Hmm. People have to listen. They want to. They're like, I'm in. Tell me. What do you, I mean, come on, help me. And if the message is strong enough, they'll want to know more. And that's the part that I want to help people understand. You can shift everything in your life and your business and in your, your, your message if you understand that. And that's why that book was so powerful. The Art of Apprenticeship wasn't because it was the best written book in the world or the, the most insightful, because it made a huge shift in me. What if I wanted to shift into this world of online, living with my laptop, having a business where I could have freedom, if I just follow the people who are doing it and just become a servant and be like the old days, like the master and the apprentice, and their job is to be servants. Their job isn't to, to be taught to. I sweep up the scraps and maybe I get to play with the, some of the leftovers and maybe work on a small menial project, but that's what apprenticeship is. And that's what I was aiming to look for. Could I do that with some of these masters who are making a living online and just serve them and by oh, maybe osmosis a little bit, but like by observation, yeah. start to glean the things that I wasn't able to learn from books and uh, online courses. So that's, that was my principle in my book. And that shifted everything for me because it, it held true. It was true that I could learn a lot by just being a servant of people who I wanted to imitate. And those simple notions are the things that hold up over time. Hmm. Yeah, that's um, great advice. And and um, I haven't read the book, I have to be honest, but I'm really looking forward to digging into that some more. I've, I've listened to a lot of your interviews with people where, you know, you talk about the ideas of building on the idea that they have and, and turning sometimes what is a, a very simple observation on the face of it into a, a really good book idea. So it's great. Right. Um, I, I guess I'm curious who who should be thinking about writing a book and, and for who would you say book's probably not for you? Yeah, you know, I think the teacher in me feels that everyone should write a book. Mm. It, it's, a, it's like putting your stake in the ground and say, this is who I am. You, you know, you can judge me if you want, but this is what I believe. This is what I stand for. I think there's something beautiful about that. Um, even in writing a picture book or something small or a legacy for your children, I think everyone should. Who it serves the most is probably people who want to be known for something. That, that's who it really serves the most. Like I, I've helped, I, one, of, one of my episodes, I had one of my, my students, actually he was a student in the school that I used to work in and he's 16, he wanted to write a three series fantasy uh, series. And I was like, okay. He had mapped them all out and he wanted to write. So I, I taught him how to get his book published and he finished doing just 500 words a day, every day, a little bit after school in between working and his freshman year of college, he reached out and said, I did it. I published my book. It was 480 pages. This is a kid who didn't have time. He had just as much time as every other kid. Uh, 19 became a published author of a fantasy series. What's amazing about that is he says, this is my lifelong goal. I've already achieved it. He goes, I'm going to have to set my <laughs> are a little higher now because I thought it would take me my whole life to write a book and now I'm done. I said, that's good to hear. He's like, yeah, now I have bigger, I can go for bigger things. And that really inspired me because his purpose wasn't to be wealthy or make his living. He just, it's his big goal. So it served him. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's people who are trying to build their brand and build authority in a niche they're new in and they have a lot of knowledge, but, but they're not known for it, you know? So having a book helps when you, when you go to a, an interview and you have a book, it's so much more powerful than if you have a resume. One of my students, his name is Seth. Um, he was a classically trained French horn player and he got out of art school, music school. And unfortunately didn't, they never really train you how you gig. I think everyone assumes you're going to play for their Philharmonic or something. And yeah, the truth yeah. is, that's not true. So you have to make a living. <laughs> they don't teach you that as much as you want. So he started doing really well by networking and marketing. He had this, that kind of brain and was always busy, always had work. And so other musicians kept asking him, asking him. So he came to me and said, like, I think I want to write a book about helping other musicians 
get into this music scene and not like make not work at Starbucks. Nothing wrong with that, but like they went to music school and they have this gift, but they don't know how to apply themselves. So he wrote this book called Breaking Into the Scene. It was designed for you know people out of music school to get more gigs. Well, that not only helped other him build a course and all these things. He he was wanting to get more experience as a marketer. So he applied for a marketing job, having zero experience as a marketer. He marketed his own book, he marketed his own course, but he went to the interview for the marketing um, position and on the shelf behind the person who was doing the interview was his book. And you can guarantee they Google you and check you, right? Yeah. But they also bought his book. So who better to hire than the person who wrote the book on marketing for the specific niche mm-hmm. you're in? And he got the job. And I just talked to him the other week. This is three years ago. Now he's just got promoted. He's doing well. He enjoys the work. He still does his music. But like that's leverage. Mm. Book authority can build leverage. And if you are if you have a big brand and you're trying to grow an audience, that's how you continue to stay in front of um, a crowd by having something to say. Um, so I think at different levels, a book can be for everyone. Who it benefits most is somebody who's trying to stand out in a crowd of, of very crowded people because so few people actually finish a book that – even if you have a degree, people would rather go back to school, get another degree than finish a book. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now you talked earlier about fear and and um, the fear of the fear of standing out. I guess where um, that perhaps holds most of us back from writing, whether it's a book or whether getting on video or getting on stage speaking and so on. I think it's, it's the same applies. Um, what are some of the other things that we kind of put in our own way that hold us back? Well, I think we live too far in the future. So we do say, well, what if, what if it gets bad reviews? It probably will. So what else are you afraid of? <laughs> like, well, what if no one buys it? Well, what would happen? No one buys it. What would what'd that do? I'd feel bad. Okay. You feel bad. What else? Like, I just try to talk them through. Like, those are all things that could happen someday. Mm-hmm. They might happen. But those are things that aren't in your control. You can't, I mean, you could give your book away, but you can't make people buy the book. So you're talking about things that you're giving away your, your dreams and future to people who, one, you don't know, and two, don't exist. Not yet. You, know, you, you don't have bad reviewers yet. So like, don't create them. Um, so I think a lot of it is is try not to live in the future about this. And I have a, a lot of people that use logic as a disguise. So they say, yeah, yeah, but I'm practical. I want to know if it's worth my time. Like what you're saying is you want to know if you can do this without getting hurt. That's like saying I want to fall in love, get married and have a great life without knowing I'm not going to have a bad marriage or get heartbroken. Mm -hmm. Like I can't promise you that those are parts of the game. So I think that's a lot of what I help people see. And then authors, they pick a topic they think is a good idea because it sounds good. But then at the end of the writing process, they are tired of it. And so they don't want to market it. So it doesn't do well. So then it does, and then it proves their point. I'm like, well, you picked a topic that you, a transactional topic that you won't care about 10 years from now. And you don't sound like you care about much now. So a lot of their fears are around, well, what if I put out what I really want and no one likes it? Well, at least you'll like it more than putting out something you think people will like. Hmm. And at least to be willing to have the conversation over and over. That's what it takes to sell books is to not give up on it. And if you're going to give up on it, you can't expect other people to stand firm and keep talking about it. So I think there's just there's places that authors live way before they ever put pin the page that I think they have to get over so that they can kind of let those drift away and kind of laugh. Go, I can't believe I'm saying this, but yeah, that's true. This is how we think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think there's a lot in that for pretty much any, almost any endeavor, really, because uh, people tend to think out in the future and. There's the old what if and what if this goes wrong and what if that goes wrong? What if people don't like me? What if people say bad things? What if uh, we have this uh, thing called the tall poppy syndrome here in Australia? So And, and it's basically you know, if, if you stand out above the other poppies, you get the head Locked chopped off. off so, <laughs> yeah, I, That's true. I think that's the same fear that you're describing is what authors have. Hmm. But it's stronger. And I'll tell you why I think it's stronger. Um, I think education does a disservice to young people who want to write. And I, I apologize to all those who I led and maybe had this way of thinking earlier on, is that we teach people to be editors, not writers. And my mm-hmm. proof is we think about, well, what's the assignment? Well, this is what it is. Well, what do I need to do to get the grade? 
Well, it needs to be edited and marked. We took a topic. So you do whatever. You mitigate the risk. Say, I want to get the fewest red marks on my paper. Turn in a paper that gives me an A. Rarely do they say, I want you to write something that will change your life in the world. That's never what you hear. Mm. It's not important. So what we do is we figure out what's the best way to edit it down to get the mark. And that's how we write emails. We edit, we type, we edit, we type, we type, we edit. And that's how we try to approach writing. Writing is a creative process for understanding. The words are just the way in which you can put it out to other people that's more efficient. But it isn't the thing. Being good at writing isn't being the same as being somebody with a conversation worth having. And so we've created a whole world of editors and we train people out of creativity. And so that's why people postpone writing that paper in college or university until the last moment. And they have those all nighters because they're avoiding it, just trying to figure out the best way to get the grade. They're not caring about the topic. And I'm not saying this is a generalization. Obviously, there are really great writers yeah, yeah. in schools. and the, But but if you think about, wow, yeah, I, I wasn't trained to think, you know, deeply about things. I was trained on how to do the writing, what makes it good, what makes it bad. And that sounds a lot more like an editor's job than a writer's job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think I guess the whole education process is geared towards meeting a certain kind of very restrictive criteria and, and it restricts creativity a little bit. I remember, I mean, this is a memory from my very early childhood that's just come to mind. And it was a uh, a scholarship examination that I sat once and it was a kind of an aptitude test and there was one exercise which was half of this whole thing and it was just write something and, and it was very much you know right and it was I can't remember the details right now but I know it was pretty much uh you know here's here's a few sentences and just write something about this and there were no guidelines and I remember writing pages and pages of, of a story that unfortunately I don't have a copy of. I'd be interesting to <laughs> go back and look at what I came up with in those days. But I remember it was just something that I thought, this is really enjoyable to kind of not have that, um, you know, you're not writing to a criteria, you're not sort of thinking about the marks you need to achieve. Yes, it was under pressure. Yes, it was, you know, obviously I was aiming to get that scholarship, but this exercise was just write something. Right. Mm -hmm. So few times, and maybe few, a few kids might have taken a creative writing class where they had more of those liberties. That's such a misnomer. All writing should be creative. Like none of it should be considered like, sure, if you want to take a technical writing, how to write a manual, how to do this. But we, we work so hard to prepare people for, quote, university. And then we, we work in university, to prepare them, write these research papers. However, we don't read research papers or textbooks or scholarly work unless we're scholars. So, so few people ever need that kind of writing. And it's sort of like people dread it because they think this is not useful or interesting. And so it, it's, it sort of casts a, a heavy weight onto young people to think if they didn't do well in school, why would they want to write? <laughs> mm. Why would they want to do more of this? And, you know, it's geared... It's, schools in general, they're geared towards the success. People who are naturally a have aptitude, they do well. If you don't, you get a bad mark, you do poor. And then they go into writing. Some people go into English majors. Some people go into vocational schools because of a mark on a page when that person could have been equally as good and maybe a better intellectual thinker than the person that could write well, but we value it more. So a lot of my pushback for people is you don't have to be a good writer. And a lot of my writing friends don't like that I say that. I said, I only write bad stuff. That takes the pressure off me. If it's good, it's a, it's a bonus. But I don't worry as much as I used to about this has to be good because that's not my business. That's the reader. That's the people who would judge it. My job is to put the best thinking, the best piece of work out I can do. And it being good or bad has nothing to do with me. Hmm. All right. The um, We've talked about the idea of fear and um, the things that get in our way and how you might be able to kind of push those aside and break through those. Um, for somebody that... that really is interested in writing a book and and they've dealt with that part what what's the next step how do you get started how do you identify um your idea that that is going to excite you right through the writing process to and right through the marketing process as well right well the first thing i tell people is you have to empty your head people usually have ideas of books they want to write probably think of two or three ideas you might want to write that's usually not the hard part. The hard part is the choosing which one. Hmm. And what I observe is people, 
don't empty their head of all their ideas because they think they're not relevant now. But books have a way of attaching themselves to other books. Like I always think of them as like books come in pairs. Like if you might have a good idea and another one is right next to it and it kind of jumps onto it. They're like rabbits though. Once they get together, they make a bazillion ideas. And then you try to write and you overstuff a book. So the first step is sit down with a blank page and empty your head of every possible idea for a book you might have. And they might be silly. It might be a picture book that has nothing to do with your business. It might be a, a travel guide, anything. But list them all until you have nothing left to, to say. Vomit on the page every idea. And then sit and look and then go, oh, well, this is why I'm having trouble. Look at all these ideas. There's three pages of ideas. And no wonder I always get stuck. So part of it is you've got to see that this is what's in your head. Otherwise, what you'll have is what people describe as writer's block. And writer's block isn't not knowing what to say. Writer's block is having too much to say. Hmm. So first, empty your head. If you think about writing a book like taking a bottle and filling your ideas into the book, which is your ideas poured in with a funnel into the bottle, which is the book, that seems logical. I'll just pour these ideas into this book and it'll be a book. And then people go to write and the funnel seems clogged. It drips. It pours over the top of the funnel, but nothing gets inside the bottle. And often I tell people, well, if you look inside, it looks fine. I go, because you have these clear ideas. They're marbles. That, you know, they're, they're marble size ideas that are blocking the funnel. Hmm. And that's what that brain dumps for. That's what that, that vomiting on the page is for, to empty out that funnel so that it's clear, simple. It's the only idea that's going to fit in there is the one idea you're going to work on. Not that the other ones are not good, but if you constantly leave those ideas in the back of your mind, they'll want to be born. They don't want to be left behind. So you have to, you have to empty the funnel before you start. So that's the first thing I tell people is like, I want to know every single crazy idea you have about a book and even the ones you think no one should know about or see. But I want you to see why this has been hard for you. And then the second one is now we have to pick some of these ideas. We have to let others rest aside. You can't, you can't use every ingredient in your cupboard to make a soup or a cake, mm -hmm. you have to just pick the right ones. And so they have to select some of the ideas. And that's the hardest part is choosing. And the biggest thing I did help you, if you've emptied your head, you found a couple ideas, as I say, now you just pick the one that gives you the most excitement energy for now. Not the best idea you think is the most sellable. That's a different path. You can, I have plenty of friends that write books that sell, like dog walking books, how to start a dog walking business, how to, how to make money on the internet. Like they're writing books to sell books. But if you're writing a book to transform and think about something big, then pick the idea you care about. That's the one that I talked about. Most people give up on their idea because they didn't pick the right idea that they care about. And that one idea is the right idea. And when people ask me, well, how do I know it's the right idea? I go, because that's the one you chose. There's no wrong choice. There's just the one mm -hmm. you choose. It's right because you choose it. And then once they get that commitment to themselves, they have the energy, and then it becomes infinitely easier to write a book because now they've shaken off all the apples from the tree, picked the right, the right apple for now and begin to commit to something they believe in. And then the book can start to have its own inertia and momentum, but you have to do those things ahead of time. So a lot of these early exercises, they're meant to help give you clarity, sense of confidence and focus on your books. Then you could talk about outlining structures, writing a plan, but all those things, if you don't, remove them, the barriers, what you start doing is creating resistance. Like Stephen Pressfield, who wrote the book, The War of Art, talks about resistance. Resistance lives in the things that you, you leave untouched, those doubts, those things. And those are usually doubts about, is this the right book? Doubts to, to know if, if you care enough about this book. And once you eliminate some of those, it helps kind of oil the wheels, so to speak, to keep the momentum going forward to finish the book. Those are my early, my, the things I often encourage people to do early on. Mm, mm, that's great. And I guess if you pick a good idea and what you're describing there is a process whereby it's it, the idea that people are most passionate about bubbles up and it's even a little bit unconscious. You know, it's the thing that um, straight away their unconscious is serving up to them so that that's right. they're most likely to be committed to finishing that and be driven to, to then do the work of writing every Correct. day to put together the content. That's right. That's exactly right. Hmm. So one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is how do you make that message then stand out? So you've got this fabulous idea you're really passionate about. You 
are you really care about transforming your reader. How do you make that message stand out, first of all, in the book itself? And then, of course, later on, um, you know, in the marketing, you want to have a message that's going to stand out and hopefully attract the right people to buy the book right. or read the book. Well, there's there, my friend Dave Chesson, who runs a site called Kindlepreneur, he says there's two ways to really write a book. You can write a book by finding what people want and then delivering it to them. Like go f- search what people are looking for and write a book for them. Or you can write a book that you care about and you find the audience that cares about it too. Mm. Uh, so when I'm thinking about this, I often ask myself, well, what what would make this different? That's where that little idea comes in, right? Mm. Um, another great writer, Jeff Goins, um, he talks about this process as that if you think about a book like this, that if a book has some sort of way of communicating that this is different in the very nature of it. So let's say you say, most people think that this is true, this idea, but the reality is this is true, not that. That helps people frame their mind around, huh, you used to think the best thing you can do for losing weight is cut out carbs. And now it's cycled back again. The best thing you can do is eat all the right fats and avoid carbs. Right, so they, they we fluctuate between messages that say most people think this is true, but actually, you know, X isn't true, Y is true. Um, so that's one of the ways you can do is start to frame your message around a small belief that actually is contrary. Um, but the other thing you can do is create your book as a soundbite. What's the message? Let's imagine you're standing in line at a grocery store, and there's a eight year old girl standing behind you, and your book's there, and she goes, "What's your book about?" And you say in a sentence or two what it's about. And she goes, oh, I get it. That sounds interesting. And you turn to the person in front of you. Maybe she's 99 years old. And she says, what's your book about? And you tell her. And she goes, oh, I get it. That's interesting. That's an, that's the right level of a book's understanding. It shouldn't be so complex that people can't talk about. The success of your book comes from the ability of other people to talk about your book. And if they can't share the ideas of your book easy enough, even if they mess up the subtitle, if they can't give what it is, then it's not going to be easy to share. And that's where books have their power, is in their ability to be shared, not in their ability to be well-written and structured. And I think that's the thing I would tell authors. is like, how do you know that it has impact? Well, use TED, for example, t- the TED Talks. Ideas worth spreading. Is it an idea worth spreading? Or is it just a really nice thought that you have? How do you know it's worth spreading? Well, when you mention it to people, they go, huh, that's interesting. Or, as Chris Voss would say, yeah, that's right. That's the test. It's a simple test. Um, is there enough intrigue in there? And is there enough intrigue for you as the author that you have a space to grow in your curiosity as you share this message? Because if there isn't anything left to be curious about, you're going to get tired of it. And you're not going to be one, I call this being wonderful, being wonder wonderful about your own work, like wonder into it. Do you care enough to keep having this conversation 10 years from now? Does it still matter? And most people think a book's about what you know, and I believe that a book's about who you are. Because we all have the same access to information. So what makes your book unique, makes it stand out, isn't that you know more than the next person. What makes it unique is that the lens you bring to it. And I describe that process as, let's imagine we all were going to write a book about the sunshine. (laughs) Well, everyone has access to sunshine. How are we going to sell sunshine when Mm. everyone has it? Mm. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I used to pick up those magnifying glasses. And unfortunately, I feel bad saying this. I used to burn ants, you know. Oh, you too. (laughs) I was just going to say, I've got a confession. (laughs) Yeah, i got a confession. Burn paper, anything I could burn, right? Mom's, you know, furniture, patio furniture, whatever would burn. But the thing about it is sun without that magnifying glass is just sun and you don't notice it. It's the lens that makes that sun so hyper-focused that it ignites. And that's what people miss. Your unique experiences in life, your view of the world is that lens. Don't get so caught up on the content. What do you view and see about this that's different? Because if you're selling sunshine, you can't stand out by selling better sunshine. The only way you're going to stand out is by helping people see hyper-focus the way you see it. And I think that's another great way to stand out, is having that clarity of understanding of how you see the world and what you bring to the table is way more valuable than the information that you can search online or read in other books is because you're unique. You're the only you in the world who can see it this way. So that's the thing I help people see is like, those are the qualities we're looking for in books. That's what makes us really want a book. We want to see ourselves in a book and a new idea or an old idea rehashed in a way we didn't think about before. Hmm. Yeah. 
This is wonderful, Azul. I could go on for ages talking about <laughs> book writing and exploring all this. And I think, you know, there's there's messages there that apply across the board to any creative endeavour, I think. So it, it really is great advice. Um, but I'm looking at the time and I think it's probably a nice time now to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And yeah. it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions for the buzz round to Great. ask you and hopefully you'll give us something really insightful and inspire people to go and do something awesome today. Great, I'm ready. So what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? I think they need to be more curious. When companies tell me they want to be more innovative and I say, tell me your curiosity policy they're like, well, we don't have one. I go, then you won't have any more innovation than you have now. So I would say be more curious than you are today. Yeah, I love the curiosity policies. Haven't heard that one before. but yeah, It's good. What's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? I think the best thing I've done to develop new ideas is test them out by just sharing them with a trusted people. Like, here's my idea. Here's the things I'm considering. Um, and then trying to ask money from people for it. Because a lot of people say, oh, that's a great idea. And you're like, will you give me 20 bucks for it? Oh, no. Mm. <laughs> Attach yeah. money to that good idea, and you'll find out is it a good idea or not really quick. Mm. That's great advice. And and I like the lean methodology where, particularly for training courses or, or product outlines, you sort of give uh, – an outline of the course or a, a feature list of the product and then get people to buy before you actually build it. Right, absolutely. Mm. All right, do you have a favorite resource that you use most often? You know, the, my my favorite tool that I've been using, using recently is turning my, when I listen to books on Audible, is turning it up as fast as it can go at first. <laughs> that drove me nuts because they sound, sound like mice but it takes me just a little while and I realize I can read twice as many books. Uh, so that's my, that's my, my new little innovation tip for getting more yeah. reading in. Yeah, that, that is great, isn't it? So how fast do you, do you listen I, to Audible? I, I, 2.5, I mean, 1.5 to 1.75 is probably my okay. But two is really fast. That's still not where I'm at. <laughs> okay. Well, well, I feel better now. I, I do too. Um, it depends a little bit on who's reading. Right. So sometimes, like podcasts, I'll do two up to 2.2, but some podcasts I have to slow them down to about 1.7 because the, the speakers are speaking more quickly. So. Correct. Hmm. All right, that's great. Uh, now, what's the best way to keep a client on track when you first work with them and they share an idea and they start writing? How do you, do you have any tips to keep them on track? Yeah, I, I tell people whenever you get stuck – do eight minute sprints. And I said, it's hard to say you don't have eight minutes to do something. So I said, I want you to go write for eight minutes nonstop and then come back and tell me how much you did. And inevitably they come back and go, Oh my gosh, I wrote as much in eight minutes as they took me to write yesterday all, all day. I was like, well, break it down into a smaller piece and then reward yourself for doing the eight minutes of work and then move on. Don't get stuck in a loop of, I can't get this done and move the the to-do list around so you actually feel like you're doing things when in fact you're just avoiding work that you can make simple or like reduce the number of words that you're going to write today. That's just a goal to keep you back on track. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. I remember the, um, my kid's piano teacher, um, when I expressed amazement that uh, young children could learn these half hour or 45 minute piano concertos and memorize them within a month or so and and perform them almost perfectly and I'd say I don't know how you do that and she said it's like eating pizza one little bit at a time that's right that's great advice yeah all right now we've talked a little bit about this what do you think the number one thing is anyone can do to differentiate themselves I think the more they can put themselves out vulnerably for the the flaws I call them the places in the shadow where we think that we're not special. Those tend to be the places that we shine. And the way I say look for them is most of us think about our lives as highs and lows. This was an amazing time in my life, a great event, an experience. And this was a low, very low time in my life, a failure, a loss. 
And most people don't pay attention to the distance in between those things. And I think the distance between great things and low moments is where we shine. And too many of us don't take time to reflect on those seemingly vulnerable parts of us. But that's really what makes us unique, um, our experiences and our vulnerabilities. And I think the one thing you can do to stand out is use those not to your advantage just to take advantage, but to your advantage to help people understand who you really are. Hmm. Hmm. That's great advice. And also, you know, we think of uh, times where we face challenge or hardship and um, sometimes feel regret about those, and yet there's a contribution in that. Um, I think it was Dave Blanchard who talked to me about, um, you know, your greatest gift is your greatest... Um, I can't think of the word now, the, the greatest... Um, a bad time that you've had that's that's actually the greatest gift you have to share with the world because there's lessons in that that um, other people can then have those lessons without experiencing the pain or the anguish that you have yeah perfect yeah great example mm. all right uh, thanks as this has been really fabulous now where can people reach out and find out more about you and find out about your books and even reach out and say thank you for what you've shared today. Yeah. Well, of course they can. I'd love if they're a fan of reading and authors, they can always listen to the podcast, the Born to Write podcast, but you can find me at authorswholead.com and uh, you can find me on social media, usually at azultoronis.com or uh, somewhere in between one of the socials. Thank you okay. so much for having me. We'll um, post links to all that on the show notes and um People can just click straight through. So what's your parting number one bit of advice for anyone that wants to be a leader in innovation and in their field? Stand up. Have something to say. Don't be afraid to be wrong. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, you've, we've talked about that in terms of writing books today at, in great detail. So good advice. Thank you. Finally then, Azul, who, who would you like me to chat to on a future Innova Buzz podcast and why? Oh my gosh. I interviewed this amazing woman that I actually helped. She was written 12 books. The reason she's amazing to me, uh, her name's her name's Heather Lee Dyer. She wrote a book called Creativity Over Perfection, The World Needs Your Book. The reason I think she's someone worthy to talk to is uh, she was raised in a hippie commune. Uh, her mom was had secret a top secret clearance in NASA in the 60s and raised her daughter as a single parent and um she f her, her mom died of lupus and her, she was received a diagnosis of lupus about six years ago her doctor said put your events in order you have a couple years to live and that's when she discovered writing and writing has not only changed her it saved her life because there's no reason that she should be alive her doctor still can't understand how she's living and i think creativity mm -hmm. her dedication to putting herself out into the world is what's keeping her there. And I think she's a remarkable person. So that's somebody I always admire and look up to. Great. Well, we'll get, reach out to Heather Lee and uh, get an introduction from you perhaps and look sure. forward to chatting with her. Yeah, Sounds amazing. Yeah. Well, thanks so much today for sharing your time and your insights with us so generously, Azul. I've really enjoyed this. I've learned a lot. There's been lots of lessons in today's um, conversation in what you've shared that I think are applicable not just to book writing but to all creative endeavours so thanks for sharing that with us today and um, I wish you all the best for the future and let's keep in touch yeah of course Jurgen thank you hope you enjoyed that engaging and inspiring conversation with Azul and took something away from his episode. It really is impressive how Azul wrote his first book in 30 days once he set his mind to it and stepped outside his fear. And I love the idea of the brain dump to clear the way for finding that one inspiring idea for your book. I'd love to know what you took away from Azul's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Azul Taronas. That is A-Z-U-L-T-E-R-R-O-N-E-Z. -E -E now, for my friends in America, Z equals Z. It's all lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Azul Taronas. 
You will also find contact information there for getting in touch with Azul, as well as links to his websites, his social media pages, the Born to Write podcast, and the other resources we spoke about in today's conversation. Azul suggested that we have a conversation with Heather Lee Dyer, author of Creativity Over Perfection, on a future in Overbuzz podcast. So Heather, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast courtesy of Azul Toronas. Remember to check out our Marketing Master mini class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It is completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. In less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity about your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an enduring, engaging relationship. And if you'd like our help to go even deeper into marketing mastery or help with podcast production, then send me an email to jurgen at innovabiz.co and we'll set up a quick call just to have a conversation and find out if we're a good fit for one another. And tune in again next week to the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got some more fantastic guests lined up, including Mel Kettle, communication specialist, and Sunny Hahn of Atlas Solutions. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the Innova Buzz podcast at innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe. I-N-N-O-V-A-B-U-Z-Z dot com forward slash subscribe. Make sure you never miss another episode. It would also mean a lot to me if you leave us a review because what you think matters. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions or questions you have, so go ahead and share them in the comments below the blog post for this episode. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating. Innovabiz.